Um, I'm Anna Saxony, and I just want to welcome you to the second annual um, Information and Service Design Symposium at, at the iSchool. It's great to see some familiar faces and also some unfamiliar faces here. Uh, I was told to give a very brief introduction. I think we all know that services are the future of our economy, and especially information intensive services, uh, which you will hear a lot about today. And so I'm going to just have, hand this over to Eric Kansen, the head of our IS clinic, who has really overseen the development of a lot of these projects, uh, to introduce the projects. Welcome to the iSchool. Thank you. Um, thanks, Anno. Again, this is my first year here at the iSchool, and this is the uh, first time I participated in this particular symposium. And um, I just want to start out by thanking everybody who's made it possible, um, uh, particularly Bob Glushko, who's sitting in the back. And he will be doing the grand summation and uh, thinking about some interesting ideas about where the study of service will be going in the future. Um, also, I wanted to thank uh, Christy Mitchell, Matt, Robert, uh, Roberta, Kevin, Gary, everybody else who's been part of this to make it all hap um, happen. And also my colleague in the back there, Eric Vilda, who is busy uh, re reviewing and editing papers with me. All of the presentations that you'll be seeing today and uh, the accompanying papers will be um, made available online for um, everybody to download so we can have a lot of asynchronous participation in this as well. And of course, I also wanted to thank our presenters, um, many of whom are um, master students, MIM students here at the School of Information. And we also have uh, doctoral students and even uh, a postdoctoral student who is participating in today's um, uh, symposium. So the presentations today will be roughly um, 15 minutes. And um, we'll have a break at around quarter to 11 uh, for about 15, 20 minutes or so, depending on how our timing goes. And in general, the program today is going to be starting um, from the very, very general um, looking at some high-level concepts, particularly around standards and business process perspectives around service research. And then we're going to get more um, specific with some um, explorations of service design, service regulation, optimization, and innovation in contexts as diverse as the criminal justice system, to healthcare, to even uh, social media. And again, Bob Glushko will be um, giving the wrap-up discussion here. And um, I also want to uh, reiterate my thanks to Anna Saxidian and also for, to Bob Glushko for really spearheading uh, services research here at UC Berkeley. So without further ado, um, I want to introduce uh, Ashwin Ma Matthew, who's going to be discussing uh, standards in services. it works now. <laughs> right, um, good morning everyone and uh, thank you for coming out at this early hour. <laughs> um, today I'm going to be talking about how we can use, look at the governance of standards to gain some understanding of how service systems operate. And just to kind of put it in perspective and give you the big picture view, I want to put out this quote uh, from a paper that was written came out of the IBM Alban and Research Center, which I think really gives you the big picture, you know, that service systems comprise service providers and service clients working together to co-produce value in complex value chains or networks. Providers and clients might be individuals, firms, government agencies, or any organization of people and technologies. Now, the problem with a quote like this is that it's really broad. Right? It covers, I mean, almost any interaction you could think of, which is why, as engineers, we often uh, look at this in terms of the diagram that I have up there on the left, which is services, these little circles, you know, with connected by lines, which are showing how data flows between the services and how interactions happen between the services. But the problem that happens is that when you take that diagram and stick it on the real world and try and wrap it around the planet, you know, you kind of start running into 
all the messiness of the real world. You've got national borders that you need to cross, different legal systems, different kind of economic systems, different political systems, uh, social forces on the ground. And how do you then try to resolve, I mean, how does this change the quality of the links between the services? And how can you try to try and build some of that knowledge into the engineering of the service systems? And perhaps even how can you kind of take a bigger view and say, are there different classes of service systems that might emerge from this kind of understanding? And I think my core argument today is to look at standards and say that standards, the governance and ownership of standards can be used as a proxy indicator to many of these more complex forces that play on the ground. So um, straight out of my paper, uh, standards are the means of co-production. What Spora et al. said that you know you have different uh, agents co-producing value in, in service systems. So standards are the means of co-production in service systems. Individual agents in a service system may provide their own implementation of a standard in their services, but it is the standard which ultimately mediates uh, interactions across the service system. That what are the standard interfaces that each service exposes, both in terms of the protocols for information exchange and the data formats and so on and so forth. So just I want to touch on a few of the qualities of standards which are important to this kind of analysis, uh, in my view. Now, first and foremost, I'm not trying to deal with every kind of standard out there. It's a very broad space. I'm specifically concerned with compatibility standards, which establish compatibility between services, right? And another very important point, I think, is that standards are information goods. And as information goods, they have a particular quality, which is that they are non-rivalrous, which is to say that I can give away as much of a standard as I want and still have as much left behind. I mean, in comparison, for instance, uh, a bag of rice is rivalrous because uh, if I give away some of my rice, I have less than I started with. But despite being non-rivalrous, standards are potentially excludable. That is, you could exclude people from participating in your standard. And it's usually split up into two modes of exclusion in terms of sponsorship and adoption. Who is able to participate in standard setting activities? Right? Um, because the firms and organizations able to participate in standard setting act activities can actually encode their skills into the standard itself and gain some competitive advantage there. And also, who is allowed to license the standard and adopt it? If you're not allowed to license the standard, you may be excluded from participating in the larger service system that those standards are enabling. And so I'm going to use these and try and navigate a larger space of analysis as we move on with the talk. Um, so let's look at the motivations for firms and uh, standards. Now, on the one hand, you would think that a firm might always want standards to be proprietary to try and control the market for services in that standard entirely, right? Uh, but on the other hand, when you have a non-proprietary standard, the size of a market can increase with increasing returns as more firms adopt the standard. And a firm sponsoring a non-proprietary standard may actually have a larger market to play in. But the problem and the trade-off there is that you get increasing competition along with increasing returns. Right? So there are these two forces that are kind of playing against each other and the intentions that firms may have. Um, another axis of uh, analysis is in terms of how standards are governed. Now, on the one hand, you have de jure standards, which are maintained by public institutions, let's say like the ISO. And sponsorship costs for firms are often fairly low because they're actually spread across all the different governments and firms participating in these standards organizations. But on the other hand, you may have de facto standards, which are privately maintained by firms that you've chosen to you know, hold in and control entirely. But the trick there is that sponsorship costs become very high because not only do they need to maintain the standard, they also need to drive adoption and try and push it out into the market and get people to adopt what they're doing. So when we put these two together, um, we will get a nice picture right there. All right. When we put these two together, we get this quadrant of different kinds of uh, analysis. And I'll be getting into each of these in some detail as we move on with the talk. So let's start with the non-pure private good. It's a strange sounding term. But as I said earlier, I mean, standards are non-rivalrous, right? You can hand out as many as you want and still have as much left behind. And in the, pure, in the definition of a pure private good, a private good must be both excludable and rivalrous. But since standards are excludable but non-rivalrous, they're non-pure private goods. But, anyway. uh, 
So in this space, we're looking at proprietary standards that are maintained in a de facto fashion by companies. As I mentioned earlier, sponsorship costs are high. And since the sponsorship costs are so high, companies may seek to uh, get monopoly rents from their markets. Now, and how might they do this? They've just got a couple of different strategies up here. They may seek to act as a sole provider of services. I mean, for instance, you look at the iPhone. Apple uh, now has an SDK out, and they're letting people write applications to put on the iPhone. But they have said that they will take 30% of all revenues of every sale. At least those are the current terms as it stands. So that's one possible strategy. Another possible strategy is to try and act as a sole provider of products enabling these services. And I think Microsoft Office is a great example. I mean, while they may be trying to standardize OOXML now, it remains to be seen what will happen with that. Uh, the old DOC, XLS, PPT, and so on formats have enabled server systems amongst companies at a global scale that you can really exchange these richly formatted documents. But Microsoft never published those, those uh, standards publicly in order to control the tools of production and being able to sell these right, as a monopoly provider. And finally, uh, firms may try to gain revenue from licensing the standard. And for instance, Qualcomm own sufficient patents related to the CDMA standard that any manufacturer of CDMA compliant hardware must license uh, the, the standard from Qualcomm effectively. Uh, the only problem that arises with this kind of standard is that competitive positions may be brittle. That they, companies can easily mount challenges to these and from there I segue to one possible challenge that you may challenge a standard by uh, creating a public good in response to it. And for instance, I think a great example today is the open document format, which was created as a kind of a challenge to Microsoft's office doc, uh, dominance in office. So public goods are de jure. They are maintained by large standards bodies, typically, and they are non-proprietary. Now, as a result, sponsorship costs are low. They get spread across all firms involved. There are increasing returns to a market as a whole. You can have Large, the market can grow, you get lots of firms uh, coming into it, they're freely licensed, and the increased competition does spur innovation. And I, I think a great example is, um, let's say, the TCP IP stack that much of the internet runs on, or HTML, right? It can, it, we wouldn't have the internet of today if these were privately held standards, and if, they were, if we had very controlled licensing. The reason that it's exploded is because they are treated as public goods. But uh, trick with public goods, and that's, I think it's an interesting caution, is that there is a danger of lock-in. That once you have a particular standard, and if you need to switch to something that's perhaps not as extensible and sufficiently different, it may be difficult to make the switch. And uh, talking of TCP IP again, most of the internet today still runs on IPv4, even though we do have the IPv6 standard available. And the reason is that switching costs and coordination, coordination problems are so high it's very difficult to make those changes once you have these standards in place. Right. Um, next up, we have club goods, which are both de jure maintained uh, by some kind of public institution, but also proprietary. And this may sound like a very strange combination, but I have a great story to tell you. Uh, I, I got really interested in the Japanese uh, telecommunications market and how NTT Docomo came to be such a major player because it seems so different from the rest of the world. And the story is that the Ministry of Post and Telecom in Japan had a board of companies which would maintain and dictate the standards to be deployed for telecommunications in Japan. Right? And in 1984, I believe Motorola tried to enter this market but came up against effectively what I'm calling a sponsorship club, that you had a club of firms right, supported by the government which could encode their own uh, skills and technologies into the standards that were being deployed in the country. So uh, Motorola negotiated, uh, got the US government to come in and negotiate with Japan, and both Motorola and AT&T got onto this uh, group of firms that could put standards out there. And Motorola's and AT&T's protocols were you know, approved as well for deployment in Japan. But what happened next was perhaps even more interesting. The, in implementing these markets, the Japanese government split Japan into zones, uh, saying that NTT's protocols would be allowed to operate in every zone, but only one other company would be allowed to compete with NTT in each zone. And those companies could potentially have conflicting standards. So 
in order, let's say, for Motorola to get deployment and, let's say, allow roaming across all of Japan, they would have to have companies supporting Motorola standard uh, win in every single zone in Japan. Right? So effectively, it creates a licensing club where companies would have to license from the, this little group of firms around NTT Docomo. Right? So it's another very interesting uh, view of the way that these systems can play out. Uh, next, we have quasi-public goods, which are de facto and non-proprietary. Uh, they are freely licensed with a sponsoring firm, often positioned as a premium brand, and the intention is often to spread innovation outside the sponsoring firm. And a, a great example, I think, is Adobe's PDF. I mean, ever since its introduction in 1993, Adobe has always published the standard publicly. I mean, I think it wasn't until 1999 that it became an ISO standard. But right from the beginning, every time they made a change to the standard, the specifications were out there for others to go ahead and implement them. So in effect, growing the market around PDF, increasing adoption, and Adobe, I mean, I think we can see very obviously today has benefited greatly from that particular strategy. Uh, another possibility is these emerging open source models of standardization, which I think it still remains to be seen where they'll go. And uh, an example that I have is that of Ziff.org, which actually created the Org Vorbis um, audio standard, and that was created in response to monopolist behavior by the Fraunhofer Institute, which owns many of the patents related to the MP3 standards. Right. So again, it's not something that came out of firms, as has been the case with many of the other examples that I talked about. It's more about some individuals saying that, well, there's this problem and we need to do something about it, and more of a bottom-up kind of thing. And I believe the uh, Org Vorbis is now an IATF standard, but I, I think this is an interesting space to watch to see what might happen in the future around uh, moves like this. So what's all of this good for? I've laid out this big uh, landscape of classification. Uh, for one, we can start to get an idea of what service system market structures look like. And when we talk about the fact that value is being co-produced, how does that function in different market structures, really? And if we, if we look at the ownership of the standards and how those mediate those interactions, uh, we start to get a slightly more nuanced view of what's going on in these markets. And then we can actually use the, um, by looking at the modes of governance and ownership of standards, we can actually try to predict outcomes, we help firms form competitive strategies around standards, and help governments form perhaps more effective regulations around standards, and perhaps take that you know, uh, the lines and dots view of service systems and try and get a slightly more complex view of how might, that might play out in the real world when you deploy it. So in closing, just to say that, uh, making my claim again, that patterns of governance and ownership and standards can act as proxy indicators for the more complex legal, economic, political, and social forces shaping service systems. And I think that it could be a really exciting area to research further. Thank you. I'm just curious. Um, I'm, can you hear me? It doesn't sound uh, like this. Yeah, is you'll on. have to speak um, up. I'm, I'm using here in the camera. You can. Okay. I'm just curious if you looked at bottom-up standards um, that are being made by groups like the microformats stuff, where they're basically instead of being a top-down standards body or being a company, where they would, you know, have a much more formal process, um, they would sort of look at the practices of how people in the microformats um, example publish and then figure out the standards based on what people do and then put something out that lots of people can follow. Well, um, I haven't looked at it, frankly. But uh, yeah, I think it could be really exciting to investigate some of those cases, because I, I just picked up the cases that I could find for this talk. But I, I know that there are a couple of people at the high school working on exactly some of those problems, information sharing kind of issues. What, is, what sorts of dimensions of governance have you, have you considered? I mean, I, I can think of a couple, like the intellectual property or licensing models around the standards, the, uh, the, the, the governance of the creation of the standard in the first place, or, the, or like the working rules of the technical committees. And so, are there other things like that that you've, you can imagine being the dimensions here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what I tried to break it down to was basically this, was just in terms of 
uh, who participates in the creation of the standards and who participates in the adoption of the standards and how that spreads out. I, I was, I think, very purposely trying to stay away from trying and looking at the specific forces at play because I, I think that rapidly becomes too complex, which may, may be one of the reasons that we try to stay away from this kind of analysis. And trying, as I said, I'm trying to look at the patterns of governance and ownership as a proxy indicator to the more complex stuff going on. Yeah. Is this working? Um, hi. This is working. Oh, it's just going into the oh. camera. Um, I noticed that your, most of your examples are in the area of communication standards and formatting standards. Mm -hmm. And um, as I'm considering the application of this, uh, point of view, it, uh, what comes up is, is financial standards or um, like you pointed to some legal, and I don't even know what legal standards are, right? I mean, I, I know, you know, Black's Law Dictionary, right? But, um, but I think it would be very interesting to see um, how the, uh, how standards work in those different domains. So you're addressing communication, but are, does the same thing operate in, in standards about sharing with regard to finance or legal? I think that would be very interesting. Absolutely, Have you, I mean, I, I would agree completely. And my so that's sense, next week's business, right? That's <laughs> next week's, yeah. But my, my sense is just to respond to that, that uh, we may see standards as some kind of club goods probably there, because it's probably groups of firms uh, that need to exchange information, and then may actually try to lock lock others out from participating in those particular bodies. Yeah, that's what the yeah. bar association is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Anybody else? Just to, to follow on that last, uh, I was a year and a half at the American Petroleum Institute, which is, a, I think, a, a really interesting uh, place to look different from the Bar Association in that you can be an oil company and not be a member of the American Petroleum Institute, but they are a standard-setting body. They, I believe their founding myth was that the, the government broke up Standard Oil and then decided it was a really bad thing to let everything sort of run loose. <laughs> so they uh, reformed a trade association in largest part, I think, to, to do the standards. And it is a problem when pipeline A doesn't connect to pipeline B yep. or if the members can't agree how when they all share pipelines, you know, what I put in is what I take out, et cetera. Uh, they, uh, when I was with them, they had several hundred people in Washington, D.C., a very large trade association, and easily half of that was on standard certification and, and the regulatory issues. Um, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ashwin. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so our next presentation is on um, business operations business process, and it's by Luke Ree. There you go. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the iSchool. Um, my name is Luke. <clears throat> I'm first year master's student here. And <clears throat> what I'm going to today is suggest the design of service system with better quality. So before I get started, uh, telling a little bit about my background. Um, so actually, I work for, the before, before I came here, I work for a high-tech company and US-based consulting firm in Korea as business process consultant for several years and published some p research paper on business process management, and time efficiency issues. So I think this paper so that, I, that I'm going to be present today is kind of byproduct coming from the combination of my pro process perspective and service science that I'm studying here. So, <laughs> so these two questions within red dotted square are uh, main, main topics in service science and the course information services economy that I took last semester. Um, especially this course 
allow me to apply my, my previous background for the service science, service system. So specifically, this paper focus on how to design the quality service system, not just service system. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce a little bit about the service system and then and then move on to how to design the, this service system. And then main, main idea of this paper on how to design quality service system will be introduced. And then finally, I'm going to explain what kind of service, what, kind, what types of services would be suitable, could fit for this time awareness suggestion. So, so the importance of service sector, service industry have, has been emphasized so far really a lot. So as evidences, there have been a lot of research practices and survey reports. So for example, so the portion of service industry is much bigger than agriculture and manufacturing or the service sector account for over 70% of US GDP or even manufacturing based company create revenue from service, their service business models. So service sector is already main industry in our life. But problem is the productivity of the service industry is very low. So, so, <clears throat> so, so the main reason on low productivity in, in, in service industry is in little emphasis on scientific approach to services. So, but, but as, you, as you can see, as you, as you can think easily about the services, the services contain a lot of factors like people, process, knowledge, and law, a lot of social perspective and physical technical perspective. So, so really, so front end service, you can see, it can be seen as a combination of complex factors like the people, intangible good and knowledge and so on and so on. So, so therefore, in order to manage service effectively, systematic, comp systematic and comp comprehensive approach is really necessary. So, so that's why service system is it's essential to design service and manage service. So kindly, IBM define service system as a value co-production co configuration of people, technology, internal and external service systems, and shared information. It's a really big, broad concept. It's containing all of the factors in service systems. So, so, you, so we can see the so service system design would be really difficult. So towards science of a service system, there have been a growing number of research practices. So this paper employed front stage and backstage framework to design service system, which has been used to business operation field very frequently. So, so here, the front stage is defined as a set of activities the customer can perceive as services. So for example, so looking, looking at the picture on the left side, you can see the person-to-computer interaction at the front stage of flight reservation service. And the, on the right side, you can see there is a person-to-person -person interaction at the front hotel desk hotel desk. So, so on the other hand, backstage is invisible rich set of information and inferences that allow the front stage to support customer effectively. So inside this system, people and processes coexist and <clears throat> some of them are completed by people or automate, automated processes. So, so, so you can see the characteristics 
of each stage is different. So different approach for designing each stage should be required. Different approaches should be required. For example, the front for front stage user centered design cognitions is necessary. On the other hand, backstage in the backstage, the effective coordination of people processes is really important. So, but but complete complete service design, the ultimately, the both stage should be connected and the information at each stage should be shared for the for complete modeling of a service system. So, but this paper once advanced one more step rather than just designing a service system. So it's just, serve, just designing a service system is not sufficient. So, so design, design of a service system cannot always guarantee the quality service system. So in the design stage, service, service design and service quality should be considered at the same time. But there are a lot of factors to be considered for quality quality service system. So like employees, employees ability, employees kindness, a suitability for service requests or service prices, service exactness. But as I as I said at the beginning of my presentation, my my process oriented background on time efficiency and business process management led me to focusing on time efficiency as a service quality factor. So here, uh, move, I, I'm gonna move, move on, to, before, before move on to design of quality service system in terms of time efficiency, uh, simple examples could be, help you understand what quality service system is and is not. So here, so look at, look at the example the customer is requesting loan, loan, loan to bank teller, but <clears throat> and he asks when to when to receive the money. But usually, typical service it's really difficult for bank teller to say exact time to get money because because he doesn't know he doesn't know the how loan approval process inside the system is going exactly. So, but right side to here, the service in a service system with product productability, bank teller can say more, provide more information for customers because this service system can connect the bank teller and loan approval process inside the system, the backstage. So in, in bank teller is at the back front stage and loan approval process at the backstage. So in order to improve the service, this service system in terms of time efficiency, the front stage and backstage should be connected like this example. So in terms of bank teller, he can give better service because he knows more information, which means he can get more empowerment to make more decision for customers. So, so another example, a customer re request, requesting finishing his application earlier than typical time of loan application, but usually it is impossible because loan procedure should follow their predefined their own predefined principles. But in a service system with flexibility, even within the predefined principles, the service system can behave time efficiently and finally enable the finishing it earlier. So, so as, as, as mentioned in two examples, so in terms of time efficiency, so quality service, ser quality service system is characterized by predictability and flexibility. So hopefully, if a service system is designed considering time efficiency and behave time efficiently, 
I can call this service system the time aware service system. So <clears throat> the rationale behind the design of better service has include two perspective, so more information and more efficient service system behavior. So 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 I'm going to I'm going to focus on the which information should be created and how this information could be utilized to design time time aware service system. So so as I as I told you before, I'm going to so service system design take a front stage and back stage framework. So first time I thought the which information can be created in the backstage so that this information can be utilized at the back front stage employees so as well as backstage because this kind of information can help front stage employees deliver better service to customers with rich set of information so i borrowed some concept from traditional industry engineering and modified them for service system context. For, so first, so you can see the employee information parts. So I can, so I can create, create some four, larger four information. The so first one is completion time. This is, this is a time when service finished and delivered. And second one is critical path. So critical path is originally from traditional project management techniques. So this is the path which takes the longest time among any other path in, in a service system. And, <clears throat> and research workload is a summation of completion time of tasks which remain unprocessed on each employee's work list. And finally, service system pays this is originally theory of constraint, originally from theory of constraint. So this is a rate as service is finished and delivered. So using, using this kind of information, <clears throat> efficient behavior of a service system is possible. So, first I, so my first idea is load balancing, which means if the assignment of services to certain employee is biased, the system detects these bi biases and then does load balancing by distributing service activities to alternative employees. And second one is bottleneck control. This is also originally from theory of constraint. So assuming resource, resources at the bottleneck determines the service system pays because the rest of the services wait for his service completion. So therefore making the resource more efficient means making whole service system more efficient. And the third one is in intelligent dispatching rule. So actually dispatching rule includes the first to come, first to serve or shortest processing time or only due days. So so in this paper what 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 this paper suggests is intel intelligent dispatching rule. So once critical path is calculated by the whole, in terms of a whole service system, and it is straightforward, activities on the critical path are most urgent. So, so employees should prioritize services on the critical path. So, but on the other hand, at the front stage, employee use information created on the backstage and provide service quality, quality service for customers because they are empowered to make more decisions using a rich set of information. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna use some, some of the examples, the possible example. So one is using, using completion time. So here, <clears throat> so just delivering those this information, so current reviewer, the backstage information, and so for example, recap, 
request service request on the review or waiting for the review so this kind of information inside the system can give customers more reliability for the answer of front front end employees and second one is about the load balancing so here this employee is identified bottleneck so he can decide not to receive service requests from customers and in, instead of it he can he can recommend to visit other alternative so who is he know because he knows who is available at this time so so he can just so he can make more decision for customer better decision for customers but in addition in addition to this those examples uh, and a lot of a lot of application can be created using this information and and <clears throat> i think so, so all all of these service system cannot be applied to time aware time awareness issue so so i define so i define four service ties for suitability for time awareness issue so one is time critical service second is multi step and third third one is composite service and fourth is computerized service so for computerized service <clears throat> so person to person service as well as person to computer or computer to person computer to computer services should be also supported by computer so in other words employee can process their task using information system because computerized service imply time information of which service can be stored and calculated for in terms of whole service system create information like critical path or research workload and service system pace so so yeah so so, so in conclusion uh, I I suggest I suggest a time aware service system not just design of a service system and so so in the backstage some kind of time relevant related information can be created and then the, at the front stage employee can use this this kind of information and then and then all of the service system cannot be applied to this time awareness issue so so I position a certain types of service for the applicability. So here is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your time. For your time. problem of providing time aware service systems as uh, providing more transparency about the back end to customers on the front end which uh, from a ba uh, from a, the perspective of, of people designing the back end system uh, they might say that the more transparency provi uh, you provide for each data point you provide to customers you're decreasing their flexibility to uh, balance loads and to sequence their work and uh, I was wondering if, based on this this uh, research, what what argument you would make uh, to someone considering making such a change that uh, that greater that that providing uh, a more time aware system is always a win win in terms of efficiency. Yeah, yeah, I, actually. So more transparency can can lead less flexibility, and but here I I focus what I focus on is share share the information between front stage and backstage. So so I think it, it's kind of matter of discretion. So front stage people so at the backstage they can they can create as many as possible useful information so and then and then front front stage people front stage employees can it's kind of matter of it's matter of discretion of the front stage 
employees. So they can just provide inf information they can they want to show to customers. So just so so the quality of service can be detected at the front stage by customers. So the so backstage so in, in the back the operation inside the backstage is is not the interest of customers. So so how how the front stage people can feel qualities of certain service is comes from the front stage. So how front stage behave front front stage people behave for customers. So yes. I think it's okay. Um maybe we'll have to take it over the break. I'm sorry for that to move on to the next presentation. Thank you, Luke. <laughs> So our next presentation is by Bayram Orozov, who is going to be talking about financial information um, on the internet and its effects. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Baram. Uh, I'm actually from the Department of Mechanical Engineering, where I'm a PhD student. But uh, my other interests are in business and service systems. So, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so that's how I ended up in the high school. So uh, today, uh, as part of my presentation, I want to talk about um, the. Uh, general effects of the web, of the emergence of the web on uh, the world of trading and investing, uh, as well as how it altered the, uh, or the effects it had on, on the field of uh, information in general and uh, financial information to be more specific. So a brief overview is, uh, first I want to talk about uh, the difference in uh, trading concepts and trading uh, environments uh, back pre-web and uh, the things how they are now. Uh, over after that, I want to uh, briefly discuss how uh, the web has basically changed time and distance uh, in the context of uh, the trading uh, world. And uh, after that, I want to briefly discuss uh, the effect on information and uh, laws, entertainment, and future potential of the, the whole space. So imagine we're in the uh, 1980s, 25 years ago. Uh, weird things are happening, interesting things are happening. But uh, a few serious people are actually uh, making or losing money on the market. And uh, to uh, put uh, some more context into here, I've uh, included a chart of uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Index in the top uh, right, and it goes from uh, 1980s to 19, 1980 to 1987 when the crash occurred, but that wasn't pretty. Uh, and you know, it's it's quite amazing. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see here due to the screen, but uh, at some points the Dow was under a thousand, a thousand point, which is like one twelfth of what it is today. So. Uh, it's really quite amazing to uh, realize that just not that long ago, actually, uh, the market was totally different. And uh, the other thing to notice is uh, the volume graph on the lower part. And you can see a steady uh, rise in volume as the, de the decade uh, progresses. So it, in a way, it sort of signaled the things to come in the 90s and uh, later in to, uh, 2000s. But uh, back in the 80s, to, to better understand what the landscape was like, uh, let's consider a hypothetical uh, interaction between a broker and his client over the phone. So uh, some average guy from Texas, let's say, uh, calls his broker, says he has some money to, to throw in the market, uh, and wants a recommendation because, well, I mean, how, how does he know what's going on? So the 
the broker is happy to assist for, for a nice fee, of course. Uh, he suggests some stock in the industry that's apparently hot. Um, and he also suggests to hold this for at least a couple of years. So uh, the, the investing time horizon was quite uh, a bit different back then than it is now. So uh, let's say the, the investor is pretty clueless, so he trusts the broker with his money, and uh, so the deal goes on. So the takeaway from that is uh, that the brokers provided individual service, but at a high fee. And uh, since the market volatility was relatively low, there was no uh, real investment urgency. So, uh, you know, you didn't have to time the market and you could uh, hold on to, to your investments for uh, a significant amount of time. And the more important part is that the brokers were really considered the gatekeepers to the markets uh, for, for a retail investor. So uh, let's go 15 years later and we arrive at the dot-com boom uh, at the uh, end of the 90s. So in the top left is actually a, a graph of uh, the tech-heavy NASDAQ index uh, from 95 to 99. Um, the lower part of it um, shows volume and you can see it's just surpassing 1 billion uh, shares traded, which is, uh, you know, you, you want to say, you want to wonder who's, who's trading if it's so much, uh, so much transactions taking place. Well, everyone and their dog is actually trading uh, and the engineers at tech startups are, you know, watching their stock price climb when they should be actually working. <laughs> so uh, another broker to uh, client interaction, but this time the guy is using a, instead of uh, a conventional broker, he's using an online system and for some reason he can't log in. Uh, so he's pretty frustrated. So, uh, you know, $10 per trade is not as much as things used to cost. So the brokers can't really afford to keep full-time stuff. So they outsourced it to India. Uh, well, you know, the guy says, sure, try again, and maybe it will work. But in general, uh, in general, uh, you know, a uh, web-based order system would look something like this. And you know they're being popular when you have cartoons uh, drawn about that. Uh, so let's see. The, my takeaway from, from this are the following. So the brokers uh, had their cost structures essentially blown out uh, by low fees, high competition, and their service got commoditized, essentially. The volatility in the market also increased, as you can see, uh, from the plot provided below. This is a graph of the volatility index that the Chicago Board of Options Exchange uh, has been using to track market volatility. And in the oval, uh, we basically have the region from 95 to 99, and you can see the index really spiking. So uh, the volatility necessitated higher urgency of investments because no one wanted to kind of miss the train and uh, people traded, you know, day traded, people uh, swing traded, but the, the idea of long-term holding was slowly uh, disappearing. And I think the most important part that uh, internet has brought about is that you have your market, or more than one market, basically on your computer, uh, instead of being some distant thing in New York. And a lot of these concepts carry over to today, except uh, the costs for uh, transactions are actually even lower, zero in some cases. Uh, there are more brokers who compete for clients, so uh, the features that users get uh, are more plentiful. So the, the user, in the end, benefits. We also have uh, the fact that the market data is now available to everyone with a web connection. Uh, I mean, you don't even need to have a trading account. You can uh, go to Google or Yahoo Finance and uh, pretty much know what the market is doing uh, any minute. 
Uh, then there's the issue of uh, the emergence of uh, or popularization of international markets, currency trading, commodities, and futures. So, you know, if you didn't need to sleep, you could basically trade 24 hours a day, five days a week, because on weekends they're closed. Uh, so, this is uh, basically global connectivity is is a pretty important uh, thing, which the web has really brought about. So now I want to discuss time and distance in the context of investing. And uh, to, to better illustrate my point, I grabbed a plot of Dow Jones from yesterday. It's a minute by minute chart, which is uh, unfortunately hard to see. But uh, this is from yesterday. And uh, if you go from lowest point to highest point, it's a 2.86% swing, which in today's market actually doesn't seem that much. Back in the 80s, a 2% day was a, was a really big day. Today, 2% day is kind of an average day, and a 1% day is like markets not moving. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't obtain the volume data, but uh, just based on the amount of swings, you can see them, uh, the, the heavy trading going on basically minute by minute. Uh, so. From that, what I get is that uh, speed matters more than ever before, especially for people who are using uh, computer packages to trade automatically. So there was a story a couple of years back that a, a couple firms from, I think, Kansas moved their trading computers to New York and New Jersey just to be closer to the market and uh, so that their execution times are reduced by milliseconds. So. Uh, Investors also hold stocks for shorter periods, again, because of the volatility. And uh, you, know, you, you don't know what the next day is going to bring, really. Like it, it's a roller coaster. coaster. And uh, the time basically got, time scale got compressed from uh, month and days to hours and minutes, which is uh, the prism through which we view uh, the, the market today. And then in terms of distance, the global markets are connected, as I said before, but they're not just connected because users trade there, but because one market affects uh, the performance of all others. Uh, and that's, that's possible because of the uh, instant news, essentially, all over the world. Uh, because news spreads so fast over the web uh, that you know, any news story in one market can really affect uh, the other one quite adversely. But the distance essentially got stretched because we go from a national market or maybe even a regional market to uh, full-scale global. So now I'm going to talk about uh, briefly about information, specifically financial information. And what I mean by that is uh, essentially two types of info. Uh, one would be uh, the type of information that essentially moves stocks as it comes out, like news, earnings reports, merger and acquisition announcements, et cetera. But, and the other kind would be, uh, uh, would be uh, sort of the info that's used for fundamental and, or technical analysis, so basically to select stocks. Uh, so the paradig paradigm change that we observed uh, basically demanded new information sources and flows. And one of the ways that the flows are uh, being generated is online. So we, we basically have the shift of print media to online distribution channels. And when things enter online, the network effects or, and economies of scale make, it, make the information free for consumers eventually. So the effect, of, uh, effect on information is uh, the dependence of stocks and fundamentals has dropped a little bit because um, again, it's, it's harder to predict long-term uh, performance, which is where fundamentals win. And the importance of fresh information is, is higher than ever. That suggests a lower lifespan of info, so the info got basically more disposable in a way. And control of information gives you more control of the market because, well, the news moves the market. So if, if that premise is true, uh, then if you manipulate information, then you can manipulate the market. It's not a new concept, but it's easier to do today because of the uh, publishing time uh, is, is so much shorter. Uh, there are legal ways to do it, but perhaps we need to update our legislation. And 
I was going to go over a couple of examples, but I don't have time. So uh, really quickly, um, so how does this change people's habits and uh, where does it go in the future? So cell phones no longer connect people only. Uh, a lot of data is moving mobile. So uh, the market data goes with you wherever you go, so long as you have a connection. Um, stock widgets could be used for like desktop trading and uh, ambient displays of information uh, could also be helpful, which uh, basically this one is called uh, ambient orb. It changes the color as the market moves up and down. So you don't need to be uh, you know, in front of your computer screen to know what's going on. And finally, uh, market as an entertainment resource. Uh, I think young, younger demographic with appetite for risk might find it enjoyable. Uh, alter, uh, an alternative to uh, online casino or card games, but this time you have a bit more uh, control and things are less random. So if you predict uh, things well, well, you get a reward, a monetary one. And finally, it also might be a uh, fashion statement and possess a cool factor, which is um, important for young people to some degree. Uh, so, in conclusion, I think we observed a huge change in uh, the paradigm over 15 to 20 years. Uh, it affected inf uh, economic, information, and social uh, spheres, but I don't think we're done yet, especially with the rate at which technology progresses. So, this is a space to watch, and thanks. <laughs> yeah, if there's any questions. Hi, that was that was really good. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, maybe on your last slide. So, what do you where do you see this going in 15, 20 years specifically? What do you think? How do you think the brokerages will be affected? Well, I mean, they they still are a middleman uh, between uh, the market and investor, and currently the legislation just wouldn't let you know you or me go buy stocks from Nasdaq directly. So, uh, unless you know the legislation changes, they might still be there, but uh, I think we'll see more uh, of the zero cost stock trades, uh, but they'll try to you know, make money on, let's say, margin accounts or option trades and stuff like that. But it, you know, if, if brokers go away, then things would be just completely different. And I don't know uh, how it's gonna play out. It's anyone's guess, really. I'm really intrigued by this uh, trend you're pointing out about the market going from being on your computer to being on your phone to being on potentially all kinds of other devices. Right. And if you think about the overall trends of convergence where the lines between your phone and your games and everything else is blurring, I mean, I mean, stop games on your wristwatch yeah. are not that yeah. far away, are they? Yeah, I think the, the stock market is getting even more uh, embedded into sort of social culture and everyday life. Uh, I mean, it has happened over the, the 20th century where, you know, starting from the Great Depression, this was sort of a, uh, in the back of everyone's head. But now I think it, it's just moving even closer to, uh, to individuals than, than ever before. One last question. Um, Two things to, to maybe add to your presentation. First, uh, I was I started as a federal employee in 1988, and that was the year I think that the agency transitioned to uh, basically a 401k plan. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a huge event for a lot of people's perception of the markets. Yeah, it went from a pension and sort of the golden handcuffs right. of long-term employment to the idea that that their we financial background was sort of portable with them, independent then of who mm -hmm. they were working for. Another thing to add, maybe in the later stages, is alternatives to the stock market per se for things like Prosper.com, where I can take some money, throw it into a, basically a micro lending situation. And if my interest is in just increasing my return, yeah. uh, there are a lot of alternatives now to the stock exchange. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the choices of investments available to people right now are really mind-blowing and sometimes I think it may just be a tough choice for people to, to settle on something. You know, I mean, 
besides this, you have obviously government bonds. You have high interest savings account where you can get like three to four percent annually, and that's not too bad, right? PayPal. Yeah, and PayPal too, right? So I mean, you you don't risk your money, but it it kind of grows. So it's I mean, it's an interesting field, and I think uh, people are getting lured in by the promise of uh, you know more money for not a lot of effort, but you know, you got to work for it still. <laughs> so. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, so continuing on with the theme of uh, social media and service, uh, we have a joint presentation um, that's going to be delivered by Yiming and uh, Ruchi on taggers versus linkers. Okay, so taggers versus linkers. So what are taggers and what are linkers and what am I talking about? So suppose that you bought your Sandcastle uh, stock and you totally lost everything and you never looked at your computer again since 2001 or something. You would have missed what is it called the tagging with the web or basically what is the core of the web 2.0 phenomenon, which is a, a new uh, paradigm in organizing information, so to speak. Uh, what the approach tells you is that uh, so well, Delicious is a great example here that I have on this uh, beautiful screen. Uh, so suppose you had a website and you want to organize the, your bookmarks on the browser. On, in the olden days, you would have put it in your browser bookmark menu and be done with it. Now you're supposed to post this to this Delicious website, and you're supposed to annotate it with tags, which are basically one word, in this case, one word uh, annotations that seem to suggest a meaning to this particular resource. So in this case, we're annotating a, a map of Middle Earth, so to speak. Uh, we have apparently maps, uh, Tolkien, for example, Middle Earth, Tolkien, of course. Uh, uh, LOTR, of course, Lords of the Rings, and map, uh, which is basically a derivation of maps, Middle Earth, and blah, 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 and so forth, right? So this is the way you're supposed to organize bookmarks now, which is interesting. And you can share with other people. So the listing here is from a bunch of users, possibly more than 100 up there. So uh, that's kind of interesting, right? Um, so what is, the, what is the problem here? Well, there are a number of problems here. First of all, what if the resource, so the web is a pretty big place. What if you don't have anyone tagging that resource for you? You're supposed to come up with these tags yourself. Suppose I'm a normal average guy. I don't want to type in all that stuff. That's a huge list of stuff here. I would have typed in, you know, maps, maybe web, maybe website. I would have moved on after that. So now we have a really poorly tagged thing. That's just sitting up there. What happens now? The next guy comes in, oh, delicious is great. Delicious suggests tags to you, makes the barrier to entry easier. Unfortunately, it suggests from the current tag set. Therefore, if you had maps up there, it would have suggested maps to you and nothing further. And as a lazy guy, well, the lazy next guy, I wouldn't have written anything as I would have clicked maps. And then this thing will stay clicked uh, and it'll turn out to be tag maps forever and nothing else. <laughs> That's unfortunate. How can we compensate for that? Well, we have a wealth of metadata on the net already about web resources. Uh, suppose, uh, the, the web itself is supposed to be a hyperlink system. When you link to something, you're supposed to annotate it with a little piece of thing that says, I link to this thing. It's about maps of Middle Earth. And here it is. So on the other corner there, you'll see a listing of links coming into this particular URL. Uh, it's grabbed from Technorati, a blog search engine. Uh, so you see the, the bold lines there describe the uh, text that was used in the link, map of Middle Earth, map of Middle Earth. Chris Taylor has created a scalable vector map of uh, Middle Earth. So you see Middle Earth is moving up there, and you see vector, which is down here and also up there, I don't know, way in the middle there. And you see map in Middle Earth and so forth and so on. And you also see Chris Taylor, which doesn't actually appear in the tag list, but is also relevant since the guy apparently created this map. So that's a wealth of information that we could have used to tag this thing had we known how to do it. Our project is intended to move us forward in that direction. We haven't quite gotten there yet, but we have some insights into what can make good tags based on anchor text and based on the other metadata currently existing on the web. So we had, to do this, we collect a data set of our own to, to test out some theories. Uh, we collected about 10,000, 11,000 URLs out of uh, Delicious, which is a nice corpus of tags. 
Uh, we also create a, uh, we basic, what, is a, what, is a, what are the resources here? We uh, grab URLs, we grab the users who uh, tag the URLs, we grab the tags, the annotations that they wrote way over there. You see up there, they did annotate some things. Uh, we time a post metadata, right? So, and then Technorati, why do we pick Technorati? Why didn't we pick Yahoo? Why don't we pick Google? They provide links, right? Unfortunately, they provide links to you one way. You get links by searching for that link. You don't get links by searching for the link, things that point to it. Now, you can say, oh, but there's an in-link thing. Well, in-link gives you about five to six results because Google doesn't really want to tell you how many things are linking to that place because suppose you were an evil search engine optimizer, you could have used that information. <coughs> so we're stuck with Technorati, which is good because they do give us links and they give us uh, proximity text, which is the description you see up there all the text over there that could possibly relate to that site. And in fact, prior work suggests that uh, this, uh, this, all this text down here could relate to that link itself. And we collected the full, page, full text of the pages we linked to just for kicks. We got about 8,000 uh, English text pages, which is about 80% of our corpus here. And uh, that was fun. Annotating English versus not English was so cool. <laughs> All right, so uh, general comparisons. So what do we discover from just at the first level? We just looked at the anchor text, we looked at links, what do we discover? Well, our hypothesis was that tags and anchor text would be somewhat even uh, likely distributed in the, in the uh, similar, uh, similar way. Because our intuition from examining the previous example was that they tend to share some similar properties, right? They tend to point to things, they tend to describe things in nice, concise little words. Well, we do discover very similar patterns here. Uh, we see the classical long tail of any two web 2.0 thing, which is that you have a bunch of people tagging a lot. Uh, res some resources are being tagged a lot, and then most resources tend to you know, die out there. Uh, this is the, actually the unique frequency, unique, unique tag frequencies by URL. So uh, over here, you see the anchor links for that URL, which you see is, follows the same rough distribution, but the magnitudes over there are, much, are, are actually significantly lesser by, by actually a statistical test. So what that means is that anchor text can be more or less diverse, actually, than tags. That makes some sort of sense, right? So when you link to something, you tend to describe it exactly. When you tag something, you might want to you know, say, this is a map, this is Tolkien, this is fantasy, blah, blah, blah. And there could be some variations there. Another thing we were looking at, uh, tags and, and anchors and titles. So titles are interesting because that's the, uh, basically the summary that the author of this page assigned it, right? So this is what he means when he uh, created this page. Uh, how much overlap is there? Can we use the title for, uh, to generate tags, for example? Well, we could. We have the results here are interesting. We have fraction of title in anchors, about 44. That means 44% of a title tends to be repeated in anchor text that we collect for this resource. Uh, for 39% of titles will occur in tags. So in essence, uh, titles are close, uh, anchor texts are closer to titles then, uh, then tags are closer to titles. Uh, again, this makes sense because, um, simply because that uh, the, uh, the, when you link to something, you tend to be very descriptive. And in fact, if you look at the left, uh, left one there, we see a significant part that's a perfect overlap, which means the guy just uh, linked to the exact title of the page. That doesn't give us any additional information about the page, which means we can't really use it later on, but that is still an interesting phenomenon to, to, to observe. And finally, we took a, a classical uh, TF-IDF examination. What is TF-IDF? It's a classical information retrieval kind of thing which says how important is each word in this document. Uh, we examine the collection in terms of TF-IDF because some people say that you know, when you tag something, why don't you just pick the most important words in this document? That could be perfect tags. Well, they are to some extent. Uh, we hypothesize that tags and anchors would be highly uh, correlated at least with uh, high TF-IDF scores. And in fact, we do. Uh, on a normalized TF-IDF score, one being the best, we do get uh, 0.19. You think that's pretty small, but the max in mo most of these things are pretty much uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so forth. So we do get pretty good matches. Unfortunately, the trick here is that not all anchors and tags are in the text, which means that TF-IDF really, uh, so, so these things really pick out only things in the document. Uh, one example is that uh, Mouser, Mouser Electronics, interesting web page. Uh, the the TF-IDF words that you calculate for this web page are Mouser Electronics and products. They're apparently an electronics products seller if you actually go there. 
So um, those are pretty tag-worthy things. And in fact, we do pick them out. And these things do overlap with the actual tag set coming in from Delicious. Um, now, there are some pretty non-TFIDF words coming in here as well. We also, the high TFIDF words for this particular URL, we have contact, we have all of them. What is contact? Apparently they had three links on there that says contact us. Contact was picked up as a high TFIDF word. Alden. Alden was a supplier for Mouser. Not terribly interesting if you want to describe, you know, Mouser. But these were, these were high TFIDF words. In terms of the machine, it thinks these words are very important. You can pick out that document by looking for these words. Now, there, are, there is, however, a, a, a TFIDF word that wasn't in the tag set. It was optoelectronics. It was a very specific thing. They, sell, they sold uh, optoelectronics, which actually means LCD displays, laser pointers, and so forth. I don't know why they call it optoelectronics. Um, but uh, this thing does, in fact, uh, show up as a high TF-IDF word, but not in the tag set. What does that mean? It means that TF-IDF does have something to contribute if you want to generate tags. Content is useful. The problem is that it's hard to pick between optoelectronics and contacting all of them because the machine doesn't really know what these things mean. That was an uh, interesting insight, and we wanted to follow up that further. Thanks, Yuming. So um, non tag non-obviousness, which is a metric proposed by Farooq et al., uh, inspired us to look forward towards subtopic detection in order to find tags which are uh, occurring in low, less frequency, but are localized to specific regions within the document. So what is ta tag non-obviousness? A non-obvious tag is one which does not occur in the document at all. So as an example, we have this sample URL about a rare mummified dinosaur. We find examples like blog and news, which are tags that are not occurring in this document and hence are non-obvious tags. Conversely, obvious tags are those that occur in the document. Now, obvious tags can occur at high frequency sprinkled all over the document, or they could occur at low frequency. We, uh, so some of the examples of highly high frequency tags are dinosaur and manning, which you see are sprinkled all over the document. We were, further in, we were rather interested in looking at the lower frequency obvious tags, which occur in subtopics or in localized areas, like Boeing, uh, the green thing here in between, and scanner or data. Inspired by the text styling algorithm by Marty Hurst, uh, we computed a simplified sliding window score, which was equal to the number of occurrences of that tag in a given window, divided by the total number of occurrences of that tag in the document. So for example, if we were to consider a window around here in this paragraph, uh, we see that Boeing occurs twice, and it doesn't occur anywhere else in the document. So uh, here, the, its window score comes out to be 1. So higher the score, the more spiky or more subtopical that that term is. Uh, we find, like, in this graph, we show the absolute numbers of tags and anchor terms uh, across the average window scores. So we find that the proportion of subtopics for tags is 0.43, which means that 43% of the tags occur in subtopics. And uh, the same thing for anchor text is about 40%. So 40% of the anchors occurs in sub subtopics. So what we believe is using NLP techniques to detect subtopics would lead us to discover tags which are subtopic in nature and would thus be able to you know, auto-generate them. Moving on to our next interesting find uh, regarding categorization systems and general and specific tags. So one of the concerns with categorization systems uh, is the level of granularity and the level of abstraction that a given term represents. So related terms describe uh, a resource across the spectrum of general to specific specificity. So for example, a tag like Ajax or Python could be something very specific for a given resource as tagged by some users, or it could also refer to something very general for that given resource as tagged by, say, some, some of the technically oriented users. Here is an example of a, a document titled Using the Feed Tools Cache in Plain Ruby Scripts, which is about feed tools, which is a Ruby library. So what we see here is the tag count distribution, which, is, which follows the classical Zipfian distribution, where some of the items are uh, 
have high frequency and the most of the items follow in the long tail. Uh, by qualitative observations, we observed that tags like Ruby or feed tools like here right in the beginning are generic tags uh, describing generic information about this particular resource, whereas tags like uh, parser or atom describe some specific information about that resource or occur in subtopics. We were further interested in looking at the general tags or the top tags uh, here which refer to the generic resource. We were interested in finding or exploring whether this, these top tags lead to the emergence of some kind of semantic groups. For this, we use the metric of cosine similarity, which is uh, a metric that measures the distance between two given URLs, which uh, shows how close they are in their content uh, similarity by looking at the TF-IDF scores normalized over the length of the document. So what we did was we started with a seed URL and uh, computed the cosine similarity of that URL with the rest of the repository, and we picked up the top 10 documents which were similar to the seed URL, and then looked at the top non-distinct 50% tags. And we found that it did lead to the emergence of a semantic group, as I'll show in the next slide. We did the same exercise for the, uh, for the top non-tokenized 50% anchors for the related pages too. And we found that this led to the, uh, this set was similar to the titles. However, we say this with not much uh, substantial conclu con conclusive, uh, because uh, the anchor set is uh, more sparser than our uh, tag data over here. So here's the example uh, that I was talking about. So for the given seed URL that I just showed two, two slides back, uh, on the left you see the tag cloud for pages which are related to Ruby. And on the right, you see the top anchors for pages related to Ruby. We find that they're related to the title. So uh, not much uh, studies have been done related to uh, comparing tags and anchors and auto-generating tag sets. We believe that the study done by us has shown very promising results for future, uh, future research. Uh, however, our study is also not without its own data set bias. Our data set being uh, that derived from delicious has, uh, is, has very technical URLs in nature because of the uh, nature of the people who tag them, who are technical users mostly. Well, we removed, since we removed uh, URLs which had no tags and no anchors, we reduced our data set and also intersecting the intersection of uh, data from delicious and from technorati further reduced our data set. So that was our data set bias. Um, to conclude, we do say that tags and anchors share some similar traits as we found, but they also have some differences, especially pertaining to word diversity and semantic specificity. We find that many of the specific tags are subtopical in nature, and top tags for similar resources lead to the emergence of semantic groups. So we believe that our study has led to a stronger understanding of the nature and properties between uh, taggers and linkers and this would help us to generate auto tags or auto tag recommendation systems, which would help us to further organize and navigate through the ever increasing amount of uh, resources that are available on the web. So with that, I conclude open to any questions. Tagging, when you can tell me automatically, this is what you really want to tag it with. Well, no automatic technique is perfect. So the idea is that we build a system to recommend things to you so we can pick among them as opposed to just having to think them up with a blank page. Because people don't think well with a blank page in front of them as opposed to some things already filled out. And with that, you can say, oh, but I tagged it with this, but it actually should be more precise with a tag like this. That introduces new data into the system, which enables the existing delicious recommendation or whatever recommendation engine you have to work better as opposed to Maps, 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 forever. Uh, you presented this interesting measure of how subtopical uh, a tag or, or a subject is within a resource, and I was wondering uh, whether you thought that there were benefits or applications for exposing to users the subtopicality of, for example, their search term within a resource. Right, so subtopic analysis is usually actually used in search, which is where we grab the idea from. Uh, so the idea is that you can point to a sub-resource of the page 
as opposed to the whole page as, as, the, as the whole bloody thing, right? So uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, the problem is that people don't really point to uh, sub pieces of the page right now. So if we can allow them to, to do that, that would be actually better for the web in general. Um, but yes, it's, a, it's definitely a direction worth looking into. If a tag is put into a document, then, then you're sort of assuming that everybody's looking for that type of information the same way every time. Whereas if I'm looking to buy a book by J.R. Tolkien versus trying to do research versus I'm bored or I want to find a song about it, my function that I'm doing at the time that I'm doing that query should impact the importance and relevancy of the particular tag that I want to find and search. Is there any connection between those two that you found? So. Uh what you're relating to is probably the retrieval of information. So that would probably be another step forward, as in when you're searching for information using tagging systems, do you use just the tag vocabulary like we saw in Delicious there? Uh, or do you want to have some kind of faceted classification where you select one tag and then you find you know, the next level of tags that are related to that tag? And then so if you want to look for research specifically, then you click on research and then you find pages related to research and Tolkien or whatever like that. So that's related to the retrieval of information and faceted classification would help there. Thank you so much. Thank you. So the next paper and the last one that's standing between you and coffee is by Joshua Blumenstock, one of our doctoral candidates here, doctoral students here. And the title of his paper, um, I'm not going to say it because it changed. It's probably, okay. <laughs> Uh, the printed one would, be, uh, would have ended up in my spam filter, but <laughs> anyway. So we're going to be looking at word counts and measures of quality in the Wikipedia. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so I'm fully aware that every minute I'm talking is a minute you're not eating, so I'll, I'll try and get through this. Um, but basically what I'm going to talk about is some work I did uh, in terms of automatically assessing quality of kind of Wikipedia in, in particular and kind of online user-generated content in general. Um, and this is kind of a non-technical version of a paper that exists in a more technical form. If you're interested in that, come talk to me. Um, so just briefly what I'm going to talk about, I'll give a little bit of background on Wikipedia. I'll assume most of you know what it is. Um, talk a little bit about quality and why it's important, and then get into the work I've done and kind of work other people have been doing in terms of measuring quality on Wikipedia. Um, so again, I assume everyone knows Wikipedia. Maybe you don't know just how big Wikipedia is. Last time I checked, it was the ninth most popular website in the world. Um, according to Alexa, you know, it's got over 9 million articles and 253 languages. I didn't even know there were that many languages out there. Uh, about 2.5 million English articles. And probably the most notable feature of Wikipedia is that, you know, it's user generated. So instead of Encyclopedia Britannica, where you have experts writing the articles, these are generated by, you know, people like us. And I'm sure a lot of people in this room have probably edited Wikipedia articles. I know a lot of people at this school do it. Um, and, you know, people will argue with this statement on the board, but in general, people kind of regard it as a good source of information. I use it for research all the time. You know, I wouldn't kind of like necessarily cite it and reference it, but, you know, when you need to look something up, it's, it's good and kind of people count on it. Um, there was a study done by Nature kind of more quantitatively comparing Wikipedia to Britannica. Uh, I won't get into that, but basically the, the, the result was that they thought that they were of comparable quality. Um, and a quote got cut out here. You can kind of see it getting smudged behind the, uh, the thing. But, but the point is that a lot of people would argue with that. You know, there's, there's Andrew Keene, who's coming next week, uh, who thinks it's a load of crap. Uh, and then this quote underneath by Nicholas Carr, which you can kind of make out, it's, he says, this is garbage, an incoherent hodgepodge of dubious factoids that adds up to something less than the sum of its parts. Um, and then this, this excerpt, this is actually taken from Wikipedia, kind of, you know, this self-referential uh, <laughs> talking about its quality. Um, and, and the point is, uh, you know, Wikipedia is a really prevalent source of information, but there is this issue of quality. There's a very high variance in quality. Some articles are good, some articles are bad. Uh, and again, sorry, this is getting, I think I, for, I, I saved this in Office 2007 and then converted it to Office 2000 and everything got messed up. Uh, but, but there is this problem of people who aren't really familiar with Wikipedia being able to tell whether or not the article that confronts them is good or bad. So you know, for, 
probably most of the people in this room, you can kind of intuitively grasp whether the article's good, you know. If you see that they spell their T-H-E-I-R instead of T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E, then you're like, oh, maybe the person who wrote this isn't on the ball, and maybe I'm going to be a little more skeptical about what I'm reading. But not everyone kind of brings that intuition to it. You know, if your 13-year-old cousin is looking at the article, maybe they'll just take it at face value when they shouldn't, or maybe they choose to disregard everything when, in fact, there is some useful information there. So that kind of motivates the result that I'm going to talk about today, which addresses ways to kind of automatically measure quality. Um, and there are kind of two components of this. One is automatic, and this gets back to what Yiming and Rishi were just talking about, which is kind of like you know, a computational approach. So when I say automatic, I mean something that involves minimal human effort. So you design the system, and then you let it go. And then, and then there's this more deep question about what do you mean when you say a good article? Uh, and I won't really, you know, this is like a metaphysical question, but I won't really get into it here. I'll just say that there's kind of two approaches that people take uh, in research. And one, the first one is this one by Adler and D'Alfaro, um, is you get a, you know, a panel of humans to kind of say, this article's good, this article's bad. They look at a whole bunch of articles and they kind of grade them, basically. Uh, this is a great approach. The problem is it doesn't scale well. You know, it, it costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. So what most people do, and what I did, and what's a lot easier, which is why I did it, is you look at uh, kind of Wikipedia standards for quality. So they, they have this concept called features, featured articles. Um, some people probably know what they are. But basically, a featured article is, uh, this is what Wikipedia says about it. It exemplifies our very best work. Um, and it's this peer-reviewed, so uh, you know, all articles on Wikipedia can be edited, but then there are these special class of articles, there's about 2,000 of them, that get special peer review, and they're supposed to conform to these, you know, elaborate quality standards. And I, I accepted four, excerpted four, uh, four kind of points that they say about, about featured articles, but really there's like, you know, it's like 20 pages of guidelines for what makes a featured article. Um, this is an example of one, the little star in the corner marks it as featured, only about one-tenth of a percent of articles on Wikipedia are featured. So uh, again, instead of saying, can you automatically separate good articles from bad articles, you kind of reframe this in a more tractable way, which is, is there a way to automatically separate featured articles from not featured articles? Um, you want something that's accurate, that's scalable, ideally it'd be inexpensive, and maybe it would work in other domains, uh, like Yahoo Answers or Craigslist or other kind of open source, kind of user-generated sources of content. Um, so this is the one slide introduction to document classification and machine learning. I'll kind of just breeze through it. But, but basically, this, this, this is kind of just going into more detail about what it means to automatically classify a document. Uh, and it kind of consists of three intuitive steps. One is to take the document and kind of measure it. Basically, derive as many quantitative metrics from the, from the document as you can. So kind of I put a bunch of things up there. This is kind of intuitive information. You know, you can measure how many words are in the document. You can measure how many paragraphs. You can measure on a Wikipedia article how many, sen how many uh, sections there are, how many citations there are. And these are things that, you know, if you were thinking about quality, you might intuitively think would be kind of correlated to quality. Um, and then based on this information, you kind of take an article. You don't know if it's featured or not, and you make a guess. You say, well, because the ratio of expletives to verbs is very high, you know, it's unlikely that this is a featured article. Or because it's very low, it's likely that it is a featured article. Uh, and then based on those guesses, you kind of check the performance. And again, the technical paper has some more kind of discussion of what it means to check performance. But uh, for this talk, I'll just talk about accuracy. Um, how am I doing on time? OK. Um, I'm just going to glaze over this related work then. Um, the point is there's been a few studies, kind of people trying to do this, this work to kind of quantitatively and computationally measure quality on Wikipedia. Uh, these guys, uh, just to give you an intuition of what they did, they, they tried to take these qualitative standards for quality, these four bullet points, and turn them into quantitative metrics. Uh, and you know it's a little contrived, but this is, these, these four things, authority, reputation, completeness, are kind of like their quantitative heuristics for the qualitative guidelines for quality. Um, and using this and a density-based clustering, which I won't talk about, they could do 86% accuracy. Um, these other guys, Zeng et al., got 84% accuracy uh, and 
I guess the core takeaway from their approach was that they relied on the revision history of the article. So they looked at how many times the article had been edited. They looked at how many unique editors there had been, thinking that you know the more an article is edited, the more likely it's going to be high, more likely you can tell whether it's high quality or low quality. Um, and again, with this method, they got 84% accuracy. Um, so this works all well and good, but it's, it's still pretty complex. Um, and you know, thinking about the like 13-year-old cousin problem, you can't be like, oh, you know, go derive the edit history for the article and feed it into a dynamic Bayesian network, and you know, then Bobby, you'll know if it's featured or not. Uh, so in a sense, it'd be nice if there was an easier way. And kind of the work I did, I actually started out doing work in the very complex, trying to find a you know more complex, even better method. Uh, and kind of along the way, happened into this really, you know, stupid result. Uh, that article length, you know, the word count of the article works really, really well at dis differentiating between featured articles and not featured articles. Uh, and these two graphs are just, you know, probability distributions on the left for featured articles and on the right for not featured articles uh, in terms of word count. And if you're used to seeing these things, it immediately makes sense. If not, the thing to note is that, uh, you know, non-featured articles are much shorter than featured articles. And this is the log of word count, so we're talking you know, very non-overlapping distributions. Um, and so kind of to put this into the framework that I mentioned earlier, you know, it's, you know, you count the words in the article, you, if it's a long article, you classify it as featured, if it's a short article, you classify it <laughs> as not featured, um, and, and you can see the accuracy metrics, which are kind of surprising. Uh, and, and this 2,000 words is actually just a very rough heuristic. I think the optimal, if you're using this threshold technique, which is, you know, like the dumbest of the dumb, uh, the optimal was eight, 1,830 words, um, but 2,000 you know, is within a tenth of a percent of the same accuracy. So you know, for all intents and purposes, you might as well remember 2,000. Um, these are more details on kind of the accuracy, but I won't get into this. Uh, basically, the slide says that if you kind of do slightly more sophisticated things than using a threshold, you know, if you use like real classifiers, real techniques from computer science, then you can do even better. Um, up to a cap of about 97.15%. Um, so that's kind of the take home message here. Those are, those are the main results. All with two minutes left, I will kind of wax philosophic about these results. Uh, but so, so one thing that's interesting to remember that I, that I, that I uh, did with this is once you've done this classification to look at the ones that were misclassified. So here there are two types of misclassifications. There are the there are the long articles that were never featured, and there are the short articles that were, in fact, featured. Um, and those, there's, there's more references in the paper, but these are a couple examples. But I would kind of challenge anyone here to go look at these misclassifications and, you know, kind of firmly and stand on firm ground and say that I could tell the difference between these two types of, you know, type one and two, type two errors, because I sure couldn't. Um, and at the very least, I'd be, like, very impressed if any kind of human judge could do better than 97% accuracy in, in, in differentiating these articles. Um, again, yeah, this, this is more discussed in the paper. Word count can automatically separate featured articles from not featured with, you know, 97% accuracy. Works much better than any other single metric like the ratio of expletives to noun phrases or something like that. Um, it works better than the revision history, which this was this Zung et al. paper that I talked about, uh, and it works uh, almost as well as like a very, very complex combination of 100 features, and so 100 metrics that you derive from the paper. Um, you could kind of speculate why this is the case. You know, the, the cynic might say, well, you know, Wikipedia editors are misled by long articles, and they think that, therefore, they're good. You know, kind of this maybe human correlate have this association of, of length with quality that's incorrect. You know, pro more likely, and probably it's some of all of these, but you know, articles on Wikipedia are, are generated collaboratively. So as they grow longer, uh, they also are more edited and more attention is paid to them. And then there's, a, you know, there's kind of a higher probability that that article, by virtue of the fact that it's long, has received more attention and is of higher quality. And at the same time, you know, if an article gets featured that's short, um, you know, then more people start to pay attention to it, more people start to look at it, and then they start to edit it, and lo and behold, all of a sudden it's a long article and no longer a short feature article. Um, I think I'll stop there. Uh, I, you know, this, this work is of a questionable utility. I think one, one thing that really comes out of this, uh, you know, in terms of divide, you know, if you were, you couldn't say, okay, everyone, 
everyone looking at Wikipedia, long articles are good, because then you know, everyone writing Wikipedia would write long articles and it would just turn into this long pile of rubbish. Um, but I think one thing that you can actually conclude from this research is that you know, it's really common practice to use featured articles as a proxy for quality and kind of this automatic classification task. Uh, and I think this work shows that that's actually not really a robust way to do it because it's so easy to classify featured and not featured um, that there's no sense in really kind of spinning your cycles trying to do you know, more advanced machine learning techniques to do that differentiation. Instead, it'd make more sense to focus on a better way to kind of proxy quality on Wikipedia than this featured, non-featured binary classification. Um, so yeah, that's it. Uh, if I have time for questions, I'll take them. Uh, Uh, not to my knowledge, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of work that's done on kind of document classification, um, but I, yeah, I'm not aware of any, if, if someone else could speak up if they are. I'm, I'm curious if you looked at um, the, you know, in your sample set, if you looked at the number of um, pages that come up in Wikipedia with a notation at the top saying, this document's really short, help us fill in, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. In other words, pushing the community to do what you're essentially looking at as the a kind of a proxy for a more fleshed out article. Right. So in other words, they're shifting the UI to, to push people to do something that you're saying is, you know, and how much of a correlation there is between the shift in the UI and what you're seeing. Yeah, so what, what she's bringing up is, you know, a lot of articles are marked with this featured star. A lot of articles are kind of conversely marked with a bad content star. You know, it'll, it'll be say, it'll, it'll have special tags uh, that say that it's like not neutral or that the, the accuracy has been questioned. So there, it's not just, there's not just only these featured articles that are good, there are also special classes that are bad. Um, and, and I did look at that a little bit, and you can kind of, instead of having a binary classification, you can have kind of like a more linear progression of really bad articles, kind of bad articles, all the normal articles, and then the really good articles. Uh, and, and doing that, you can kind of, yeah, you can refine this metric, I think. Um, another thing to bring up is that there are, um, and the citations in the paper, there are kind of efforts underway to do more user-generated rating of, of the quality. So, like, I know there's like a... I think it's called the Bi Biography Assessment Project or something like that, where all the articles that fall under the category of biography, they're trying to have uh, editors grade them on an A to F scale. Uh, and so something like that would be much more useful uh, as a way of kind of like visually uh, discerning quality. And, and also for you know, this machine learning literature that's looking for a, a training set to, to learn these me measures. Lack of star is a little bit different. What I was talking about is, you know how they'll put a band across the top of an article yeah. and say, this article is not fleshed out. It's no comment on whether or not it's, it's good. And, and in fact, actually, lots of people could come along theoretically and say, this is totally it. Like, it's been covered in this very, you know, short way. I, you know, so I, I just see that a lot on a lot of pages at Wikipedia is the band, which doesn't make a judgment as to quality. And I'm wondering, if that at all, and you know, to you mean, try like to how figure that would out, yeah, interplay if, if yeah, something how, with that how much of a role does that play like that. in in your theory or you know of proximity as to length and quality? Yeah. No, no, I didn't. Although I will say that there was some other interesting work, and in, in a lot of the work you've seen today came out of a, 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 the course series that was taught at the school. Some people tried to build an interface on top of Wikipedia, so it took the data but then let people kind of give like thumbs up and thumbs down. Uh, and, and I think there, there is some really interesting stuff that could be done there. I, I didn't specifically look at it though. Any other questions? Thanks so much. Oh, there's one more. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so let's um, take a few minutes for a break and then we'll come back and um, go with our last round of presenters. Evan Tessa Avila, who's going to be talking about um, her work, work looking at commercial data brokers 
and the um, interaction of commercial services with the criminal justice system. So thank you. Um, so my title is a little different from the one in your uh, program as well. I thought this was a little catchier. Um, so this work is about the role of public records in the private sector and specifically what I'm going to be referring to as corporate data brokers. Um, and I'll explain that a little more as we go through. So practical obscurity is part of my title, and it's a good concept to keep in mind. This is a legal doctrine regarding the privacy and access to public records. Um, basically, the Supreme Court is, has said that there's an interest in privacy with respect to public records. Even though they're public and anyone can access them, it's worth preserving the relative obscurity of public records that comes from their being scattered around in different public agencies, throughout the country. Um, so this works well in a, in a world of paper records where these records about people's conviction history, their tax history, et cetera, is like in records throughout the country. They're, and they're kind of hard to access because you have to go to a physical building, search through some physical files. The doctrine doesn't work so well. It's harder to preserve that, that, that obscurity when you have digital records. You know, suddenly it's easier, faster to move things around, repackage it, etc. So in the past 20 years or so, private sector companies, these corporate data brokers, have, be, have been gaining prominence and getting a lot more business. Um, they harvest data from public records, basically, repackage it, aggregate it, um, and sell it to as in background check services to employers, insurers, landlords, um, various people who need to know more about you. Um, it's an extremely valuable service and it confirms that your applicant is trustworthy, they're a safe investment. Um, and for most of us, I mean probably everyone in this room has had one of these background checks run on them. And most of you probably hardly noticed it because it happened because everything turned out all right you got your job you got your loan whatever um, and this work is being done in conjunction with my final project where we're looking at how data moves from the, from the public to the private sector um, working specifically with the East Bay Community Law Center which um, I'll, I'll explain that a little more later what they do so what's the problem in this picture well, a quote from one of, my, one of my favorite movies, we may be through with the past, but the past ain't through with us. So while if you have you know, a spotless record, it's fine. Not everyone has a spotless record. And even people with, spot, with spotted records um, have sometimes reformed. So, but the negative information in public records doesn't just go away by itself, even after you've reformed finished your probation su successfully, had drug or anger management treatment, um, and years of good behavior. But there is hope. And this is where the East Bay Community Law Center <coughs> comes in. Um, they basically run a clinic where they help people get remedies for old convictions. Remedies are sort of a legal path for getting old convictions dismissed or sealed, and there are various ways you can do this. It's very complicated, but basically it means that they'll either note somewhere on your record that you reformed, that we're setting aside this conviction, or occasion in certain circumstances you can actually get it erased. And it's like, it won't show up for most, in most situations where you're applying for a job um, or a loan application or whatever. Um, the problem is um, sometimes these remedied convictions seem to show up in background checks and the community law center uh, has had several clients who have come in and thought they had something dismissed but it showed up and they lost a job opportunity 
um, and need help getting back on track. So basically, these are really big consequences for people. Uh, lost opportunities, lost housing, lost jobs. Um, and when things go wrong, they go really wrong. So there are very important policy and service quality con considerations, data accuracy, um, that we need to look at. Sort of to give you a snapshot of where information is going in this picture, um, disposition records, the standing of the case, whether, you know, the person is guilty, whether they've had a dismissal, uh, those originated with courts. And private data brokers go into the courts and retrieve these records. We're not sure exactly how that works in every situation, and it's, we know it's different from di in different jurisdictions. They aggregate this information, provide it to employers who are making hiring decisions. Employers pass those decisions on to job seekers. And sometimes if the decision is negative and the job seeker has um, a, ra a bad rap sheet, they'll go and seek a petition for remedy from the court. So it can just be an ongoing cycle. Next, I'm going to take a look at our roles and stakeholders in a little more detail. So we have the courts. That's uh, Renee C. Davidson Court up in Alameda County um, in Oakland. Um, basically, as I said before, records are begin here and they're stored here. Um, in considering this as a service system, courts, you have with courts and other public agencies, you have this really fraught, complicated question of who is the customer here? Whose interests do they have at heart? And as with all public agencies, they have the public in mind. And that's not very useful, because who's the public? It's, it's everyone. And it's all three of the other stakeholders I'm going to be talking about over the next few minutes. So the court kind of has to balance all these interests. And as you'll see, they are conflicting interests. And it's very complicated. And on top of that, courts often have limited resources in terms of man hours in terms of technical infrastructure. And they need to keep in mind this issue of access. You know, at the very least, there is information in court records about victims, people who are vulnerable. And so they have to keep that in mind at all times. Data brokers are our next group. Collect, aggregate, and sell personal data. Uh, these are companies like ChoicePoint, Axiom, LexisNexis. Um, ChoicePoint is probably one of the is probably the biggest player in this field, um, and they've actually agreed to talk with us a little for our project. Um, an important consideration here is the front and backstage services aspect. The front stage being what the customer sees when, when they interact with a person or a system from the service provider. And in that, and the backstage being what they don't see, what's going on behind the scenes to prepare that service. The front stage service in this case is that they deliver a report to a person or about a person based on information provided by the employer. So this is a nice, neatly packaged thing that they can print out that supposedly gives you an accurate view of what this person has done, where they've been, and whether you can trust their answers to, on their job application. The backstage service is where things get murky. I mean, they don't keep a, you know, an individual file on each person. They're querying the records they've, they're querying records and data that, they, that they've collected from all over the country and trying to sort of match up these facts to people. And as you can imagine, a lot of people have common names. Things can get confused. Um, there's not been, as far as I can tell, any major wide-scale study of the accuracy of data broker records. However, based on anecdotal studies that people have done by getting a bunch of their friends together and requesting their own records from, the, from these companies, 
there are a lot of errors. In some, you know, in one anecdotal sort of survey, they got 11 people to get their records and all of them found at least one mistake. So, and, and these can be, you know, minor mistakes like, um, well, I'm going to move on because I just got my five minute card. <laughs> um, so, okay, employers. Uh, employers are allowed to ask about convictions in, in certain circumstances and it depends on the type of employer. Um, and they generally will want an external check on on this kind of information, especially if it's the kind of job where you're going to be in contact with vulnerable populations. Um, and, you know, that's legitimate. They need to avoid liability for hiring people who might be put their customers at risk, who might put their business at risk. Um, job applicants. So, Job applicants may have convictions, they may have sought or received remedies. Um, assuming that, job, that the applicant has put everything in order and that they're applying in good faith and they're not going to pose a risk or they don't think they're going to pose a risk to this person's, to the, to the employer, um, there's a concern for accuracy and timeliness of the data on the background check. The interesting issue with job applicants, though, is unless some negative information turns up on their application and they're denied employment because of it, they usually don't think, don't think about the existence of these companies, of data brokers. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people who are like, really? And it's, you know, people at first are like, wow, there are p companies that do this, and suddenly it makes a lot of sense. Of course there are companies that do this. You get background checked for tons of stuff now. And so this is sort of, this sort of makes for an inherently negative service experience because, you know, people, they find out that this conviction that they thought was taken care of is showing up on their background check. And they're like, where'd you get that? And you change it, but the data broker can't actually change the information, all they can do is tell the applicant, this is where I got it, and you're on your own. So policy is, can provide an important framework for data brokers as service providers. Currently, there's not um, large scale, um, detailed federal legislation on this. Uh, California has a really good law called the Investigative Consumer Reporting Agencies Act, which um, I won't go into too much policy detail, but it has provisions in there about uh, how often you have to verify your information, um, you know, giving people access to it, auditing your external customers. Then in the Fair Credit Reporting Act on the federal level, there's a small uh, section in there regarding data brokers of the sort who provide background checks. And sort of as a broader framework, um, there's the Federal Privacy Act, which applies a lot of the same stuff, a lot of the same guidelines to government agencies as the ICRAA of California does for data brokers on a national level. But the Privacy Act doesn't apply to um, private companies. Another aspect of, I think, the solution to creating more accurate records is public sector innovation. Um, courts need to have technology infrastructure that ensures accurate and timely data, and they need to have appropriate access to access restrictions to make laws laws meaningful. Um, many states are developing such system right now, such systems right now. Um, this is largely in response to September 11th, and a lot of it, a lot of the impetus comes out of the law enforcement side. But um, there will be benefits on the the court side and getting remedies and disposition data and such. Um, one standout is Colorado has an integrated 
criminal justice information system that has ha caused like drastic improvements in the accuracy of disposition data held at different agencies. So the rate at which um, the disposition on a case matches between, say, the courts and the correctional institutions and law enforcement has gone way, way up from like 12% before the system was in implemented to 90% 10 years later. Um, California also has a long range plan to integrate court information systems. So summing up, um, better legislation, better public, public information systems uh, infrastructure, and I will take questions now. Magnolia. Magnolia. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. So our ne next talk is um, <clears throat> by Vladimir uh, Stanchev, who is a postdoctoral researcher over at Computer Science, and we're moving now into service implementations in healthcare. So hello everybody. Um, I'm staying actually at the ICSIE in Berkeley as uh, some kind of sabbatical from my actual duties at the TU Berlin. Um, and we have at TU Berlin something that's uh, similar to the ISD program here. And uh, that's something we call public services. So I want to, to introduce that a little bit. Um, I want to make one of our major claims actually that very often we can improve services using techniques that are already um, employed in sectors as logistics, as uh, industrial production. And um, I thought quite a bit what, what example should I take from, from our work. And uh, after some, some discussions with, with Eric, um, I thought our experience in, in, uh, in healthcare would be something interesting because uh, we have the talk after me that's also uh, showing a very similar use case where actually context awareness um, in medical um, scenarios is uh, also evaluated. And at the end, I'll give a short conclusion of um, the talk. So uh, in our group, we, we have public services uh, in our title. And what we do is actually we look at things like healthcare, like um, e-government in a very broad sense, like municipal, uh, services. A very big topic particularly in, in Europe is the whole thing that we call service-oriented architectures. This is basically matching services from the business view, from, from the actual people delivered or human delivered services with the technical infrastructure that's behind them and also with um, service-oriented approaches there such as web services and so on. We also have the topics of, of security that uh, encompass uh, services and we have, uh, so to say, a business branch where we look at services that companies provide but that are very uh, interconnected with public services, meaning like, um, for instance, uh, we are working there together with Motorola to look at ways how um, bidding in public public um, projects can be done like um, digital radio systems for, for police or uh, for law enforcement. And uh, in the area of e-health, we um, had several projects and they were pretty much um, focused in um, optimizing service delivery in e-health scenarios. Um, 
So by saying public services, we mean pretty much every service that is offered to the public. And as the speaker before me already said, the public can be pretty much everyone. So um, examples of such services could be you want to register a business, and that's a service that the, actually some state agency is offering to you. Um, typically in Europe, we have uh, requirements for reg uh, residence registration, meaning when you move, you have to register with, with your community or with the police. And of course, with institutionalized healthcare, we have a lot of health-related services that are actually delivered through public or semi-public institutions. Uh, we also uh, have several projects that deal with uh, supporting activities like uh, facility or, or vehicle management of, of communities. Uh, and um, one major challenge, particularly in the area of e-government, is actually this, this layered structure that with the EU as the highest level and a federal state like, like Germany and then the different states down to the level of one community or one municipality. And we have many different requirements that are imposed from the EU that have to be dealt with at the lower community level. One example is the so-called services directive. So it's interesting because it's also about services that are delivered from, from self-employed people, meaning if you want to deliver some service at one place in, EU, in the EU, you actually need to expect the same procedures, the same registration requirements, regardless of the place where you are actually uh, in right now. Meaning, if you want to go to, to Munich and want to start up a plumbing business, you have to expect the same interface, the same ways of providing information to an agency as when you do that in um, some other place in the EU, say Spain or Italy. So a lot of questions about data standards, integration, and um, information ex ex exchange uh, also going on there. So at, at the TU Berlin, we have spent the last quarter of century actually optimizing production and, and also logistic chains and so on um, by actually looking at the business processes that are, um, that are the, uh, used to accomplish such a production or to deliver a service and to um, by defining ways how you, you can optimize them. So um, when we first started, we, we thought actually there's no need to reinvent uh, everything. There are a lot of proven concepts that we can take from there. And um, what um, our approach is uh, something um, that's actually um, a gradual approach, we, we first look at how people, how uh, agencies are operating right now. What are their current activities and processes? We try to define optimized processes by actually uh, interviewing experts in, in this particular field, say in, in uh, banking or, or uh, insurance and so on. And uh, we come up with uh, some kind of uh, ideal process. And uh, there are several aspects of how you implement this, this ideal process, meaning you employ IT supported automation. Automation was, was also a very important issue in several talks um, of the talks today. So we want to actually focus on uh, business processes and activities that can be formalized first, meaning everything that can be formalized uh, can be automated. So in the example of this um, credit application, 
we can just say if there are uh, is, if there is a certain data set that uh, the applicant can provide and based on this data we can um, say yes or no or just, just define the interest rate of this, this credit, then this is something we should automate. Uh, if there is um, a knowledge intensive part of it, meaning that you have some, some mathematical experts actually deciding on uncertainties and looking at further data, then this is something we can only partially automize. And um, this is where actually we employ IT. Uh, the other aspect is the organizational aspect, meaning we actually um, tend to, to, to see everything in business processes. That's basically also the view of, of uh, the main consulting companies worldwide. And um, with a process view, you have more clear responsibilities. You have, uh, say, people that are process owners, uh, people that are respons uh, responsible for certain performance indicators of a process. So, so there is a lot more transparency going on. And um, the third aspect that I have tried to visualize here with this uh, uh, clip art is actually the motivation of people. People are often underperforming due to um, not non-present and non, uh, not enough motivation. There's, this is not only monetary, but people are often um, more motiv uh, motivated by, by certain um, intracollegial acknowledgements or, or some, uh, they, f they should feel that it is important uh, that what they do. And this is um, the third part of uh, our view of actually implementing service delivery. So when we apply this to different sectors, there, is, there are a lot of different motivations. And for, for the healthcare, I tried to um, make a small summary from, from uh, issues of McKinsey Quarterly from the last couple of years. And several important insights uh, were there. First of it was actually that um, a patient is more inclined to choose a hospital based on the non-clinical experience. Like, um, were, there, were they able to uh, keep um, a time that they promised in Mink? Come to us uh, for a visit that will take half an hour at noon, and he stand there and waited for, for, for an hour before this happened. Um, Patients in general would like to uh, have better information what is actually happening with them and why are things taking longer than expected and what are the actual um, actions that would be, uh, say, taken upon them. And one recommendation from McKinsey was that uh, executives at hospitals should look at ways how uh, they can address this. And one other point about actually transparency in the healthcare system is the uh, problem with uh, payment flows, particularly in institutionalized healthcare, where the uh, patient is typically not paying directly for a service, but all the payments happen somewhere behind. So a patient is typically unaware of how much, uh, say, one visit to his doctor actually uh, costs him. So when we look at clinical environments, um, we uh, notice that the idea of, of thinking in processes is not that much present uh, there. Doctors very often focus on their own specific area of expertise. Um, we have complex tasks like um, very much knowledge-based, things are not easy to, to, to uh, automate. We cannot predict workloads, uh, meaning if, if an emergency or some, some bigger accident happens somewhere, 
we could have very high workload um, very unexpectedly. And it's also the question of efficiency versus quality, meaning at least patients often tend to, to um, assume that if something is done very fast, then it's probably not that much quality in it. So I try to visualize the different steps here, meaning uh, before an actual operation takes place in the operating room, so we have to take care and prepare the patient for it. Prepare meaning we have first to assess what kind of operation a patient needs. We have to do further tests. We have to uh, bring him to the, to the operating room and, of course, all other resources here, uh, things like scalpels and medications and so on have to be there also on time. So an operating room and surgeons are actually a scarce resource that we want to have uh, actually optimally used in a hospital and there are a lot of low cost and low profile activities that often prevent us from doing that. And what we did in this particular context was uh, we looked at ways that, that experts propose to optimize processes in the operating room. So there is a nice publication from Sandberg et al that actually proposes such an optimized layout for, for an operation room. And we simply took that. Uh, there are actually five major steps involved, like move in from the patient and uh, optionally a transfer to an operating room table, the induction, the actual operation taking place here at number three, and um, early recovery from anesthesia, transfer to ward bed, and transportation of the patient back to the ward. So what we thought of was actually the idea to combine a health information system that is already deployed in um, a lot of uh, hospitals with electronic health records as a uh, means of information with uh, location awareness. Uh, and location awareness, um, we thought of actually using standard-based uh, wireless LAN positioning because wireless LAN is an infrastructure that is very much present in uh, hospitals. So that's something we can use as uh, technology to provide location-based information for us. And as further step, we provided data access uh, for, for the doctors, we were able to track movement of, of instruments to, to detect whether an instrument is uh, actually being processed to be disinfected. And uh, in doing so, uh, to have the usage of the scarce resource, the operating room, and the surgeons actually optimized. So, key benefits of such solution are cost transparency, because we actually now very much know how much the preparation for a specific operation exactly costs. We have a lot of fewer delays, meaning our expensive resource, surgeons and operating room, does not wait, uh, do not wait 15 minutes before uh, a forgotten patient is brought in from, from the ward. And um, of course, this also has a very uh, positive um, implication on the perceived ability of, of a hospital to serve its clients uh, on time. So concluding, uh, we were able to use approaches that are there and that are used in, in scenarios such as logistics and industrial production to optimize a certain type of public services. Uh, using the three key aspects, process thinking, enhanced IT support, and uh, of course, the observation of human factors. And a lot of issues, of course, there are some were mentioned from the speakers behind me, meaning um, it's personal data, it's always sensible. And issue from technical point of view is particularly 
uh, things like performance and availability of such information are really uh, critical, not only mission critical, but life critical in these scenarios. Okay, thank you for your attention. Just want to apologize for garbling up the title. Sorry about that. Oh, and we have any questions? Yeah, Chris. That's a really interesting example. So, in, when you when you deployed this system, then did you have metrics that actually you know measured the you know, patient satisfaction or uh, efficiencies that were built into the process? Before that, actually, um, not that much. Meaning, um, the whole idea of process thinking is still not that much present. Meaning, um, doctors typically assume that there is a certain number of processes that should take place before they can cut <laughs> and a uh, certain uh, amount of processes that need to be done afterwards. But uh, they typically didn't care that much. And uh, we were able to do this case study with, with a private clinic <coughs> where actually the, the, the motivation of the administrative directors were not that much different from the motivation uh, from the surgeons. So after that we were able to, to, to assess uh, these things and actually um, made the case when compared to similar metrics taken from other hospitals. So, But this is the big problem that actually uh, people that, that uh, come to us from, from hospitals are very much aware of all the symptoms but they don't have a clear metric uh, how much goes wrong actually, but they, they are very much aware that a lot of things go wrong, so, so they actually don't need a metric. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, well, thank okay. you so much. Well, thank you. <clears throat> so our um, last presentation is going to be delivered by um, Jill Blue Lin, and it's a presentation and collaboration by uh, also including Zach Gillen and Kate Arn, and um, on a very closely related topic around um, MD notes and uh, healthcare services. Thank you. Yeah, I figured. Okay, um, my presentation is called MD Notes, uh, Designing an Information Service for Public Hospitals. This presentation is based on a final project report by um, my team members, Catherine Ahern, Zach Gillen, and myself, Jill Blue Lynn. Our advisor is Bob Glushko. Um, the project clients are two public hospitals, Highland Hospital and San Francisco General Hospital. These both are public hospitals, so they have limited funding. And uh, we chose them partly because they have uh, very similar IT systems, which makes it easier for us to work with. We have some primary stakeholders, the uh, clinicians, which are the physicians and nurses, who will primarily be using the system. In addition, the secondary stakeholders are the finance and billing departments, the IS department, and the administration. And these all support the doctors as well as um, use the information to do financial um, and, and billing information. Um, in supporting our design for this system, we did contextual inquiry interviews, uh, and we talked to a wide range of people who had responsibilities around progress notes. Um, anyone from the vice chairman of surgery to assistant managers to some residents and nurses. Uh, on the secondary stakeholder side, we also talked to uh, the director of medical information services and some people from accounting departments. Um, all of us have had the either first or secondhand experience of waiting for a very long time in a hospital waiting room. Um, there are many reasons for this, but as we'll see later on in the presentation, um, one of the um, one of the main reasons is uh, patient. Uh, physicians actually have to spend a lot of time um, looking for a patient's record. Um, it's important for the physician to have a good context of 
where that patient's coming from, and therefore he or she likes to look at the patient's medical record before the um, patient encounter. This is a diagram of a medical record, and you'll see there's a lot of information that, think, that can go in there. There are um, operative reports, which is a summary of what ha happened during an operation, um, radiology reports, um, a summary of x-rays. What we're primarily focused on is uh, progress notes, and we'll see what that is in just a few minutes. Okay, uh, one of the problems is that the healthcare industry is moving from using paper charts to store patient information and um, electronic records to store information. On the uh, right there, you'll see a stack of paper charts, and these are basically manila folders into which all the uh, patient record information is kept. And if you've been going for, to the hospital for a long time, um, you'll actually have several uh, of these manila envelopes. On, the, uh, on this other side here is um, a screen capture of somebody's uh, electronic record that's stored um, in a database system. And you'll see that um, progress notes um, are, can be stored either on paper or in electronic format. Okay, so a progress note is primary documentation about what happens when you go to see a doctor. For example, every time you see a doctor after you leave, like he or she will write up a summary of what happened. Um, taken as a whole, they provide a rich history of your patient history because they span lot different visits and different physicians. Um, physicians enter these notes under varying conditions. There's a big difference between inpatient where uh, doctors are making rounds as they see patients in the hospital, and outpatient where um, they're seeing patients in exam rooms. There are different types of notes, but we are primarily focusing on progress notes for our project. Here is an example. Um, there's a paper form that um, uh, doctors fill out to write a paper progress note, and on the right we have the electronic note. Okay, this slide here demonstrates the state of transition. Um, San Francisco General Hospital has two sources of funding. They get money from uh, San Francisco as a public hospital, and then as a research hospital, they also get money from UCSF. So what ends up happening is um, each little group within the hospital can get its own funding from the different institutions for projects that they think are particularly important. And so you'll see here that um, they, oops, um, mostly doctors write notes by hand, like 70% of the time all notes are written by hand. But some groups are using methods like dictation. Um, um, there's one example where WebMedics, um, a company that takes dictations and then turns it into transcription, and the way that they do it, um, this actually is compliant with the hospital's electronic system, and so the record can then be stored electronically. But there's another example um, used by the trauma and critical care services, where they're using a different provider to do dictation and transcription. And as a result, um, this provider doesn't provide the transcription in a format that can be mapped to the electronic re medical record system. and so. This is stored, it essentially becomes a part of the paper record. And you'll see that that's true for speech recognition as well. So this is just a really good um, way to see how many different methods people are using to write progress notes. Um, over here we have a sequence diagram of a doctor either dictating a progress note and also writing a, a progress note. You'll see that um, there's much fewer steps needed to write that progress note. All the doctor needs to do is to get the form, fill it out, and give it to the nurse, and he's done. Whereas with the dictation system, what he has to do is to go to a separate room, log in, you know, enter the per patient's medical record number, um, dictate the note all at once, um, re-speak the categorization information that he um, previously entered so that it doesn't get miscategorized, and then wait for the uh, transcribed version to make edits and then sign off. So you see that it's a much longer process to dictate. 
And this is part of the reason that doctors prefer to handwrite notes, because they actually think it's faster. The problem it comes with retrieval. Uh, this is a sequence diagram of a nurse trying to find a patient's medical record. The two columns on the right-hand side in that red box, that represents um, a system that's really pretty hard to use. What the nurse is doing in this case is going back and forth between different screens, memorizing information from one screen to be able to use it in the next screen. However, this nurse is so used to using the system that he doesn't actually perceive this as a breakdown until he can't find the record in the electronic system. And then he physically has to go to a different room to look for a copy of the uh, chart, which is called a shadow file. And sometimes he can't find the shadow file. So then what happens is the doctor has to either reconstruct the uh, medical history by re-interviewing the patient or by um, calling around to get faxes from different departments, or actually from, by um, reordering medical tests. Um, some issues that we see in um, the lack of consistent adoption of technology is um, the lack of overall funding to adopt new technology for the whole hospital. I mean, different groups can go out and get funding for smaller projects but it's hard with uh, decentralized sources of funding to get enough funding for the whole hospital. In addition, uh, physicians, as they should be, are very focused on uh, patient care, and so they don't really have a lot of motivation to learn a new system. They also don't um, really perceive the need. Uh, when we asked um, the physicians why so many charts were missing, they, they really didn't know, and they thought that it was faster to write a paper note but they really weren't taking into account the time it takes to um, find that paper note later. Um, in addition, for transcription, which does um, at Highland Hospital turn into an electronic note, the time required for a human being to uh, transcribe that dictation into text form actually made it impractical for use in a lot of um, cases. So some key takeaways for design. Um, Doctors, we found, they, there's no one method that they prefer. Some doctors really prefer handwriting, some really prefer uh, using uh, speaking the notes, and some doctors prefer typing. So what we'd like to do with our service design is to provide a product that allows them to either do um, speech, using speech recognition, or text entry. Um, we think it's really important to have multiple devices because the inpatient setting and the outpatient setting is very different. Um, inpatient needs a lot of mobility because they're making those rounds. Um, we'd like a system with as little overhead as possible so doctors become convinced that it's actually faster to use the system than it is to handwrite the note. Um, for the secondary stakeholders, we would need to demonstrate that the um, product actually saved them money. And of course, it has to be compatible with the hospital's existing systems. Uh, this is just a brief diagram of what we're proposing. Um, we'd like to model the patient in XML data and then transform that data so that it can go into interfaces for different devices. And then we're proposing that we use a speech recognition and keyboard um, methods on the PC devices and speech recognition and either touch screen or trackball on the mobile devices. Um, and by doing this, we hope to make it easier to create notes and to retrieve notes. Um, we want to eliminate the transcription lead time and ultimately, um, hopefully, store all progress notes electronically so that um, and shorten patient wait time and improve patient care. Anything else? Uh, any questions? Yes. <clears throat> First of all, I'm just thrilled by uh, that you're doing this oh, project. It's great. a tremendous undertaking, and I can see a lot of benefits to a lot of people. I'm, but it's funny as when you said the finding that little scrap of paper later, mm -hmm. that's the thing that really hit me. And it seems to me that um, your project, together with the work that's being done on tagging, and uh, and linking right. that there can be tremendous benefits in incorporating some of the work those folks are doing with what you're up to because you're generating 
a whole host of different types of data. Right. Yeah, and it also reminds me, I was working with a client years ago on, um, there were researchers in the pharmaceutical industry, and the issue was how could we find the source of the research that 20 years later resulted in uh, a <coughs> compound that could be patented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all the researchers' notes were in these bin, you know, in these file cabinets back somewhere. And at that time, we were looking at um, uh, tablet PCs and stuff. And right. so there was a whole uh, piece of uh, handwriting recognition that came into play. And it's just it's it's thrilling that you're <laughs> that you're working on this. So I just want to applaud you for taking it on Thank and you. Um, say that I really do get not only the um, the challenge of it, but also the benefit. I mean, I'm writing notes right now. Like, when am I going to find this little piece of paper? So <laughs> do it, do it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay, so I want to introduce Professor Bob Bleschko, who's going to um, summarize what we've heard today and also point towards future directions. Thanks, Bob. I don't do the, uh, I didn't make slides in the last 30 seconds, I made some notes. <laughs> Interoperability of the plug. All right, whenever I attend a, an event like this, I try to make uh, note of the catchy phrases in each talk because I can use them as memory aids and then I can use them to, to sort of follow them later to see if they catch on. So let me start with what I heard today kind of a Letterman's top 10, but this will be Glushko's top eight. Uh, and I'll sort of get, give my impression of each of the talk, and I'll try to come finish with some, which I viewed as the, view, what I view as the key themes of this symposium and of our program in general. Uh, we began with a talk by Ashwin Matthew about standards and services, and he used the phrase that I noted as governance patterns. Um, it's a framing for how standards mediate interactions and service systems, and I think it's very promising to think that we can predict uh, technology adoption uh, a little bit with this idea of how uh, the, the technical and other standards around the technologies are framed. That to me strikes me as a very provocative idea. Uh, we next were followed by Luke Ree who talked about time aware service systems. He talked about connecting the front stage and backstage uh, to enable efficiency and flexibility in service system design. And I really like the scenarios, the concrete scenario of the person trying to get uh, the loan at the bank and seeing different scenarios of interacting with the uh, uh, employee. And this notion of a front stage and a back stage, and you've got to somehow think more broadly across the two of them and see how information flows between the two of them, is again a really important theme of information and service design. I really like the third talk by Byron Morozov about uh, essentially running the time machine back to the 1980s to, to contrast stock trading back then and now. And this idea that the stock market is really becoming ubiquitous, in some sense becoming a form of entertainment that may be indistinguishable from, say, online gambling is, is, is a very, very interesting idea. And again, I'm, we're all going to watch that very closely, I'm sure, if we're not addicted to it already. Uh, uh, Yuming and Ruchi gave a talk about taggers and linkers I particularly like the idea that we're going to go beyond the superficial hype about, hype about Web 2.0 uh, and apply some more rigor, the rigor of discipline of, discipline of natural language processing techniques to impose some, some substance on this question of what a good tag is. So my phrase there was tag quality, which I will use to, to follow that body of work uh, going forward. That's related in a way with Joshua Blumenstock's talk about Wikipedia quality. That's my slogan for that talk. But Joshua, uh, a word of advice. It's generally not a good idea to say your research produces stupid results. Uh, how about strikingly counterintuitive and conceptually elegant results? <laughs> that might be a better way to say it than my work is provides stupid results. So I was really impressed by the strikingly counterintuitive and conceptually elegant result that the length in the words is a better identifier of featured articles than these more intelligent and obvious uh, conceptually clunky results that uh, other people have proposed. Uh, Evan Test Avila's talk on justice information, 
uh, flow or public data information flow in the justice system was refreshing and scary at the same time. After several talks about how fast information moves or changes, it was an intriguing shift to hear that information was not moving or changing fast enough. Um, but I was encouraged by the, to see a project with the compassionate goal to apply the information service design concepts and methods to helping people who have been harmed by problems with information quality. So to you, Evan, and your team, thank you for doing good things. You know, you're a good person, OK? Uh, but the phrase there that I noted was this phrase about the past doesn't go away even when you want it to go away. And uh, that's you know, sobering, and I guess uh, we all need to think about that more. Those of you who are using MySpace today and things ought to think about whether you want the past to someday go away. Uh, Vlada Rastanchev's talk seemed out of order to me. I would have put it third because it really seemed to follow, for me, the other talks about service systems and creating a service science by applying concepts from other disciplines to the service sector, I was struck there by the challenges to effective delivery of services posed by layered government. So that's my phrase for that talk. Um, and the fact that the perception of service quality in the public sector is shaped by, uh, in the hospital sector, is shaped by non-clinical patient experiences like scheduling and payment. It's a very compelling argument for a service system perspective. It says you can focus on what you think your core business is, your core competency is, but if it's connected to other things, they will contribute to the quality of experience that your uh, service recipient ex has. And that's uh, probably not something we pay enough attention to. And finally, Jib Lin's talk about uh, Project MD notes. Um, she used this phrase that I, I wrote down because I thought, well, that's too damn polite. Uh, decentralized funding for new healthcare technology. It's a very polite way to describe what I would view as a desperate scramble for money to, in, that's plaguing the public sector hospital system. Um, and again, the, I guess I understand better why the quality of service and the healthcare service system is as poor as it is. I'm more sympathetic to doctors and nurses now, but the system is broken. And fortunately, this kind of project uh, gives us some hope that we might someday fix it or at least improve it. Uh, well, let me look at the recurring themes in those eight talks. In some ways, I think it's audacious to, de to define an information service design program that purports to deal with such diverse aspects of information and service design as you heard today. Uh, there's a real fundamental overloading of what the concept of service is. Uh, many of the concepts, uh, techniques, and, and classes we teach about service and operations and services uh, emphasize and originate in person-to-person -person services. But many of those concepts don't really fit very well when you start trying to apply them to uh, automated services, self-services, or services where you have automated processes doing services for each other, or web-based intensive services, and so on. Uh, so I'm struggling to say, does service, when we say person-to-person -person service, and service, when we say service architecture or web-based service, are those just homonyms? that happen to have the same pattern of word service? Or are there really something conceptually coherent there? And I don't think we're going to make any real progress toward a science of services if we don't find some abstractions that unify them or that establish clear boundaries and applicability between them. So that's, that's the goal of the ISD program. And the idea of service system really seems to be onto something there, because it really is a theme that we can apply uh, to technology adoption, to financial services, to the criminal justice system, to e-government, to healthcare, and it provides insights in all those different contexts. And so, there may very well be make, we may be making some progress toward the science of services, and that's clear that service systems is going to be a key part of that. A second key theme, I think, is that we're making progress toward the science of services by bringing in concepts from other disciplines, traditional engineering disciplines. Uh, into this new service science. And here this concept of front stage and backstage seems very useful to bridge the user experience kind of, kind of aspects with those of the more traditional implementation back end kind of concepts. And by this idea that a key way to, to address service systems is to bridge the front stage and backstage by sharing information. Here I was really struck by Andrea Mowat's comment uh, that more transparency in the of information at the front stage is not always desirable. So this is interesting because it might under, undermine discretion of the service provider. 
So there's going to be some really interesting research to be done there about understanding the trade-offs of, of information exchange versus an, an empowerment as a result, as well as the kind of negative empowerment of now knowing too much that you don't want to necessarily reveal to your service customer. Uh, so again, it's very, very promising. Some of the papers apply these concepts like time efficiency and optimization to the front stage experience. The third theme is what I might call the emergence of Web 2.0 science. And I now have more confidence that that's not an oxymoron. Uh, it's encouraging to see that, that, that if, if while one of the defining things of the information and services economy is that information moves and changes more, much more faster, at least it's getting to be more computable. And we're getting much better at doing the right computations to get insights, even if they turn out to give us strikingly uh, counterintuitive and conceptually elegant results as opposed to complicated ones. Remember that phrase, never say stupid work again. Okay, and at the risk of abusing this idea of Web 2.0 science, let me conclude on a more personal note. I really enjoyed this morning, I really enjoyed listening to these presentations because they illustrate a kind of intellectual mashup. That's a Web 2.0 word, people, all right? <laughs> that's uh, going on in this information and service design program. And if I wasn't already part of it, I would want to be part of it now because this is really, really cool things going on. So for those of you who are not part of this as, as students or as partners or, or uh, sponsors, I really encourage you to become part of the information service design program. And with that, thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the talks on the web and the papers and so on. Thank you, Bob. Okay, well, thanks once again for um, coming, and also, especially, I want to thank the uh, presenters, everybody who came and uh, put so much effort and hard work into putting the presentations and the papers together. So thank you all very much.